see that now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, OK, good. Um, so. Um, just to explain here, I'll be looking um, to the right and to the left of me. I've got my timer on the left and I've got my notebook on the right, so I'll be looking around as I'm speaking. And um, I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction to some basic concepts in research. For some of you, these may be quite familiar and hopefully there'll be some space for questions at the end. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to say something about myself. Um, I have my background really in clinical work is um, in mainly in stroke rehabilitation. So I understand that most of you today will be coming from a, a mental health background. So my experience in mental health OT is limited, really, um, other than what I did as a, a basic grade rotation as a student. Um, but um, hopefully what I've got today, today will, will still be of interest. Um, so I worked um, for, I was employed by the NHS for 15 years. Um, for a lot of that time, um, I was team leader for stroke rehabilitation in um, the Royal Liverpool Hospital and Broad Green Hospital. And um, if anybody knows the Royal, it's, uh, well, as I'm sure some of you, some of you do, um, now part of Liverpool University Hospital Trust. It's one of the busiest accident and emergency departments in the country. Um, and we were very proud of the work that we did in stroke rehabilitation there. So uh, my role was as team leader for um, what was called a complex team. Uh, so I did a lot of work with them, um, with service users with stroke and stroke survivors, um, both at the acute stage and then at the subacute, so the rehab stage in the stroke rehabilitation unit at Brook Green Hospital. That's my um, clinical background. Um, and there I was very interested in um, the both the motor and sensory side of rehabilitation, particularly focused on um, rehabilitation of um, the hemiparetic upper limb, but also in cognitive and perceptual rehabilitation as well. That's another key interest of mine. So very interested in memory and attention, information processing and perception as well um, in, um, in neurology. But since um, 2015, I've been working at the University of Liverpool. And um, for a short time, I worked as a, as a, um, a um, had, had a joint academic and, and clinical post. But if anybody is familiar with those posts, um, and perhaps if anybody's been speaking today, they'll know it's actually very difficult to maintain those over a number of years. So I opted in 2015 to um, become a full time academic at the University of Liverpool. Um, and but what I have done and I've attempted to do is to maintain a clinical profile and with an honorary contract at uh, um, World Teaching Hospitals. Obviously, with the um, with the current um, with the pandemic, it's been difficult to maintain that. Um, but I have um, spent some time at Clatterbridge Hospital and would like to you know, possibly go back there again once. Um, once the, the pandemic situation is uh, is resolved um, now. Um, and that's working in there uh, with neurological patients. Um, now, my research interests, one of the um, things which I think is a bit unusual is that my research does span both um, very quantitative research, um, as, we'll see, as, as I'll, I'll talk about during this presentation, but also um, qualitative research as well. So I work in both fields. Um, and I've, um, you know, so, so I can talk a bit, a little bit about both approaches. Um, hopefully that will be of interest to you. Now let us um, go on to um, look at the, you know, the things I want to talk about here today. So the first question which occurs is what is research? And I want to try to define a little bit what research um, actually is. So research is a, it's um, an approach um, to um, to reality, to to, um, to the outside world, in which um, tested procedures and methods are used to gather and synthesize data. Now, I want to um, just focus on this word synthesize um, for a minute, because it's quite an important word that comes up in research. And um, synthesis means that you draw connections between things. You show how things fit together um, and try to draw some overall conclusions on it from it. Um, in research terms, that can be done in, in very many different ways, as we'll see um, in future slides. Um, but this idea of synthesizing, bringing things together, showing the connections between um, individual items of data <coughs> um, is, is very, very important. Um, so not just gathering data, but synthesizing data. Now, as a result of using tested procedures and methods, 
research has a methodology. Methodology means the study of method, um, how we um, how we conceptualize the methods that we use in research. And we will see that research, uh, different approaches to research have different associated methods and methodologies linked to them. And um, also, and um, research should involve exploring data in an unbiased and objective manner. Now I'd like to focus in here on this word bias, um, which unbiased um, comes from. Now bias um, in research terms, obviously we use that, we use the word bias in, um, in, um, in everyday life in a slightly different way. In, in everyday life we tend to, if we're biased about something, it means we might be have an unfair attitude to somebody or something based on some characteristic that they have, which we don't particularly like or judge in some way, that would be a um, bias and it would be and considered in clinical practice to be very, a very poor thing, a very bad thing, wouldn't it? If we were biased towards some of our service users because of particular characteristics that they had. Jonathan, sorry, yeah. just to interrupt. I, I don't think the slides are moving along. Um, I think if you try and put it into um, slideshow, and then you might oh. be able to manually move it across. Um, so what slide are you looking at now, everybody? Can you tell me? It's still the first one, the introduction oh, page. How about now? Anything now? No, no, it's still still on the introduction page. So what I'll do, Tori, is I will um, come out of slideshow and I'll go back into it again. Because I can, it's it's moving fine here. Give us a sec. Let's see what we oh, can lovely. do. Sorry for Sorry interrupting. Sorry about that, everybody. I'll Thank see if you. I can sort this out quick. Um, Oh dear. Um, so I'm going to come out of sharing now and I'm going to go back into sharing. So let's see if I can, I can see it now. OK. Now, can everybody see that? I'm sorry, yeah, what slide brilliant. are you looking at now? What's the slide that you're looking at now? So it's the what is research one. Oh, that's it. That should be the right one. Um, and what about now? Thank you. Sorry, which one are you looking at now? The first page, a brief introduction. Now? And then the next one, what is research? That's it. So that hopefully that's working now. Sorry Fantastic. about that. Thank you. Um, OK, so we just talked about the idea of bias. Um, and the point I was making was, was that in um, our everyday life, we often use um, words in some ways and which are slightly different to the way they're used in research terms. So I've talked about the word bias. That would be considered um, quite um, a bad thing. For example, if you were working in clinical practice and you treated your service user um, differently because of some characteristic they had that you perhaps didn't like in some way or had some kind of irrational um, response to, that would be bias and would be considered to be a bad thing. But in research terms, the word bias um, indicates um, things which may be influencing the results of the research, which the um, researcher has not acknowledged or has not controlled for. So things which can be distorting the research results in some way which are not acknowledged or controlled for by the researcher. So here's um, an example from quantitative research. If, if it was the case, for example, that you were interested in um, assessing or the um, resting blood pressure of students between the age of 18 and 21, um, and you wanted to take a sample of, or say all of the students at University of Liverpool, um, and you wanted to take um, measurements of their resting blood pressure, um, to try and get some average data, some mean data about what the resting blood pressure of a typical student is, um, then if you recruited students who were only available on campus, if you went around campus on a Wednesday afternoon to recruit students, so to speak, um, this you would likely get bias in your results. And the reason is, is that because Wednesday afternoons at universities traditionally is an area, uh, is a day when there's no teaching and it's the sports fixtures afternoons. So when, you know, when um, university sports teams go off to play um, matches against other universities. Now, what that means, of course, is that students who are around on a Wednesday afternoon are more likely to be athletic, they're more likely to be fit, and as a result, um, are more would be more likely to have a lower resting blood pressure um, than, than other students would be. So you would have bias in your results. If you um, measured those students only, and then said um, that this is therefore th this the mean values of blood pressure that resting blood pressure that you found in this group were representative of what you would find in the, the general population of students at the University of Liverpool between the ages of 18 and 21. And um, that would be um, an inappropriate um, um, statement because in fact what you've measured were what your sample would have been a biased sample because the sample that you used 
would have, would have been students who are more likely to be quite fit in the first place and therefore more likely to have lower resting uh, blood pressure levels. So you would have bias in your results. Now, um, a lot of, especially in quantitative research, um, a lot is the, the methodology or the methods um, are aimed at reducing bias. In other words, controlling for what are called the different variables which could influence the results. So one way in that, in that hypothetical example that I just gave you would be to sample um, the student population in such a way that um, and any student had an equal chance of being included in the sample. So it wouldn't just be students who ran on a Wednesday afternoon. You would use a technique which would make, mean that um, all students between the ages of 20, 18 to 21 had a reasonable chance of being um, invited to take part in the study. Um, and that would hopefully lead to less bias. And when you when you reported your results, when you reported, say you had um, a sample of um, 500 students um, and the, it should say the population of students in the, the University of Liverpool is about 20,000. But if you had um, a sample of about 500, um, you could say with some degree of um, of certainty that the mean resting blood pressure in your sample and would be generalizable to the, to the wider population of students because you know in other words, because you controlled um, for that um, um, in during your sampling and anyway, that would be called random sampling um, so that's the concept of bias bias is all about trying to stop um, uncontrolled for factors influencing the results um, in a way which means that the results are actually quite misleading and in, indeed um, the the way we and explore data in research should also be objective. Our own subjective opinions about the research should be kept to one side as much as possible. And a lot of scientific method, um, in especially in quantitative research, is all geared at that, trying to keep the subjective um, views and viewpoints of the researchers out of the picture when analysing the data. Um, I've, I read once that somewhere it said that um, and the scientific method is basically a way of stopping researchers fooling themselves about their own results um, and trying to keep their own kind of subjective interpretations out of it. And that's important because, of course, if you're testing a treatment, a hypothesis, you want your treatment to work, basically. Um, you know, you want to um, be able to find evidence that what you've that the treatment that you've um, that, you, that you're testing um, is useful and successful. And therefore, and there's always a temptation to look, you know, to to stress the most positive results. So um, scientific method is a way of stopping that happening, basically. Um, one of the things that we do, for example, in, um, in quantitative work is that when we're analysing data, we introduce what's called blinding into the process. And what that means is, um, is that the um, the researcher, for example, um, when if when looking at the data um, the, the from the experiment, say they say they're testing out um, um, they're testing out a new um, approach to treating people with dementia, such as cognitive stimulation therapy. Um, they have um, one group of um, service users who just have normal OT, standard OT, whatever that is, um, and they have one group of service users who have standard OT plus cognitive stimulation therapy. When they look at the results, say for example on levels of, um, say for example on a memory screening test, that's the outcome measure, when they look at the results on the outcome measure, the idea is in blinding is the researcher doesn't know what what groups results they're looking at. They don't know whether they're looking at the experimental group or the cognitive stimulation therapy or the um, control group who just have the normal OT. They don't know. So in other words, they could be looking at either group. And so the analysis is more objective. And um, that's called blinding. Um, and you have when you have double blinding, and that means that the service users themselves or the participants themselves and so you don't know what they're being treated with. Now in occupational therapy research, that's very, very difficult um, to ensure because it's pretty clear if you're if you're receiving cognitive stimulation therapy, for example, um, it's clear whether you're in receiving it or you're not receiving it. So it's difficult to blind um, um, the participants to what treatment they're getting in OT type research. You would expect to see that if you were looking at um, a major pharmaceutical um, 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 piece of research, um, for example, a new um, if a new medication was being treated. Uh, sorry, was being examined. For example, I remember when. Um, I was um, working in Broad Green Hospital. It was a huge international um, 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 a piece of research going on, looking at the effectiveness of um, of a new medication um, in promoting recovery from stroke. Um, it was administered by research nurses, and the research nurses basically had um, a sugar pill and the real pill, which they were distributing to different participants who agreed to take part in the study. Um, they looked the same. 
they tasted the same, um, but they were different. And the only people who knew what was what were the people who'd actually, um, who were actually um, controlling the allocation control group. And the nurses who were administer administering the medication didn't know what it was, and the participants didn't know what it was. That's an example of what's called double blinding. When the research is assessing the data um, at the end of the trial, or the participants themselves don't know what, what um, medication they're receiving. And um, that's an example of what's called double blinding. And again, it's a, it's a way of introducing objectivity um, and taking up the subjective factor, because if somebody felt that they were receiving the medication, they might begin to um, respond in a different way because they felt they were getting the, the um, this experimental treatment that they heard about, for example. Um, so it's all about trying to control and reduce those type of factors. Now, um, secondly, Oh, sorry, thirdly, sorry, uh, research is conducted within a philosophical framework, as we'll see, and we'll talk about some of the philosophical approaches which underpin research in a bit. So um, research uh, may be of different types. Research can be primary, and this is when um, the researcher is involved in collecting new data um, about um, a topic. Um, so um, actually carrying out research to find out something new, sometimes called discovery science, um, to find out something new about a particular area. Um, <clears throat> um, but research may also be secondary, um, and this is about reviewing data that's already in existence. Now, one area um, where this has really grown in recent years is in the area of what's called systematic review. And this is in a type of secondary research, which is um, popular to in occupational therapy. In systematic review, um, the researchers will basically survey existing um, the results of existing research articles on a specific topic of interest. Um, they will then, um, if it's quantitative, for example, they will then bring together the have, they have statistical techniques to bring together the data from different studies and treat them as one single study to analyze the data. So in other words, you might have um, several um, several studies with quite small samples, but by combining them using special um, statistical techniques in a process called meta-analysis, um, they can um, that they can analyze it as if it's one big study which which produces much more um, much more compelling results and much more um, informative results basically than lots of small studies. Um, and this can be done in systematic review. Now, this is quite important for us in occupational therapy and for me specifically for someone who's got a background in stroke, because um, a very important and influential systematic review came out in 2007 by Leg and colleagues. And this was a, syst this was a systematic review published by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is a, um, an international co collaboration, academic collaboration based around systematic review, um, which is often considered the gold standard in systematic review. Um, and the, this particular one showed that by surveying the and, and reviewing and doing meta-analysis of the results of several research articles that had already been published, they were able to show that occupational therapy um, focused on, um, on retraining personal care activities actually was very effective um, for stroke patients. So stroke patients who had occupational therapy, stroke survivors who had occupational therapy, um, focused on personal care activities had a significantly greater chance of um, achieving independence in personal care um, than those uh, than those stroke survivors who didn't. So it showed basically that occupational therapy worked, and it's and that means that we are one of the few professions um, based uh, in, that are involved in stroke rehabilitation that have some body of evidence, convincing evidence, to show that what we do works. So we're very proud of that. Um, and it was a very important piece of secondary research, which was a systematic review. So systematic review is quite influential. Additionally, research can be inductive um, or deductive. In inductive um, approaches to research, the theories and hypotheses are generated by analysing the data. So what this means is, is that the researcher doesn't approach the data with uh, a pre-held theory or hypothesis. The idea is, is that they look at their data and by continuously going through the data, say, for example, the results of interviews or the transcripts of um, focus groups, for example, and they look for themes which emerge from those transcripts. And eventually on that basis, they begin to generate a theory or a hypothesis based on what they've seen, what they've read in the data. So in other words, they don't. 
pre-existing theory or hypothesis that is generated by looking at the data. This is called an inductive method. Um, one of the uh, well-known examples of this approach is what's called in what's called grounded theory, which is an approach to uh, in qualitative research. And grounded theory, as the name suggests, is about developing theory from the ground up. The researcher looks at their data, analyzes their data repeatedly, iteratively goes through the data, looking for themes, linking those themes together, and then on that basis, then we'll develop some theories and hypotheses. They don't approach it um, with a pre-existing theory. Now, I should say that people have criticized this view on the basis that really we all have theories and hypotheses in our heads, and it, it's unrealistic to suggest that um, you know researchers can simply naively put these to one side. And indeed, in more contemporary versions of grounded theory, there have been attempts to kind of include this notion in that the researcher will have some kind of theory or hypothesis. At the other end, research can be deductive. Um, and this is where the researcher has, um, a, they seek to accept or reject a pre-existing hypothesis by analyzing the data. Now, this is typical, of course, of quantitative research, experimental type research, because in experimental research, um, the researcher will generally have a hypothesis that they want to test. Um, they will say that there's, you know, there's, a, you know, they, they will hypothesize, for example, um, that um, the use of splinting in um, the um, hemiparetic upper limb um, can help, um, can, can impact positively upon recovery in um, upper limb hemiparesis following stroke. They have a hypothesis about that, which they seek to accept or reject by analysing their data. Now, um, in, you know, in kind of um, very rigorous science, the, the, the idea is the researcher has both a null hypothesis and they have a research hypothesis. Their research hypothesis suggests that this treatment will be effective. The null hypothesis suggests the treatment will not be effective and will not make any difference to the participants in the study at all. And in the most rigorous science, the idea is that the researcher should actually seek to test the null hypothesis. Um, it's another way of taking out any subjectivity out of the research. In other words, because the researcher may hope or expect their research, their, their treatment will work, um, you know, which is the, the, hy the hypothesis of the research hypothesis. Um, by having the null hypothesis is starting off with the idea that it won't work actually makes takes that subjective element away and it again ensures greater objectivity um, in the findings. So there's some um, things which um, some other characteristics of research. Now I want to um, go on now to talk about um, um, research paradigms. So a paradigm is a conceptual model which um, um, underlies an approach to research um, and um, I want to talk next about some key paradigms. Um, so paradigms um, are said to have three characteristics um, and also ask some um, specific questions. Characteristics are ontology, epistemology and methodology. Let's have a look at each of those terms. So in ontology, these are all philosophical concepts. Ontology, the question is, what is reality? What is re existence? Um, for some researchers, especially people in quantitative research, the ontology is, is that reality is out there to be discovered. It's, it's measurable. It's, it's, it's something which exists externally of our senses and can be measured. Um, so ontology um, and things, things definitely exist and um, beyond our perception of them. And we can measure them and understand them to some extent. Um, that's the ontology. Alternatively, uh, an alternative ontology might be to say that, uh, as we'll see, um, um, reality doesn't really exist beyond our, our perception of it or even our interpretation of it. These are the key things to take into account. So ontology can, um, there can be different types of ontologies underpinning research. Um, the next um, um, characteristic of a paradigm is what's called epistemology. And epistemology is all about knowledge. What is valid knowledge? How do we determine whether knowledge is trustworthy? Now, you can see, hopefully, that this concept of epistemology does relate back to ontology. Um, I should say these are all Greek terms. Ontology comes from the Greek word for existence. Uh, ology means to study, to study, of, study I think, uh, the study of existence. Epistemology, um, that comes from the Greek word for knowledge. It's the study of knowledge. Um, and um, so, you, so, so when... Um, in epistemology, we ask what is valid knowledge. What we are saying is, for example, if you if you have an ontology which suggests that the way people perceive and interpret their world is the key thing um, in reality, um, then your epistemology 
um, is going to look at how to, you know you consider valid knowledge approaches which attempt to explore that to understand the way people look at their world so when you do, we look at more qualitative approaches and we look at people's feelings experiences and viewpoints that's the epistemology which comes from that type of ontology but if we believe on the other hand that ontology i'm sorry that reality is a something um, objective outside in its like, separately to our sensational perception of it um, then you might take a more of it in epistemologically you believe that experimental uh, approaches are more appropriate um, where you try to control elements of external reality in order to try to isolate the phenomena to to analyze it um, and understand it in some way um, so um, and, and I would say as well this doesn't necessarily mean that the researcher has to walk around being a, an ontologist who doesn't believe that reality exists objectively people's perception or believes that objective reality is there you don't have to believe one or the other the question is I would say is what kind of questions you're asking at any one time in your research and that would give you an idea of what ontological and epistemological um, um, standpoints you might take and I would say both can be valid in different circumstances um, it's not that you have to commit to one type of ontology or epistemology for the rest of your life both can be um, useful in different for depending on the questions that you're asking as hopefully I'll show in the next slide okay, so let's move on um, methodology is how we find things out the study of methods methodology the study of methods and how um, research is conducted now we move on to our final slide as we come to a close here um, and um, then I want to look briefly at approaches in ontology epistemology and methodology so ontology um, some three key approaches here the realist um, ontology suggests there is one objective reality which can be measured this is of course um, um, very much linked to um, experimental work um, and um, quantitative research from my own research I mentioned that I've, I've, my work spans both areas the more kind of realist work that I do is I look at um, movement analysis um, of the hemiparetic upper limb following stroke and this involves very reductive work um, measuring joint angles and um, ranges of motion in the joint measuring things like position and um, 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 velocity acceleration of different joints using electronic techniques um, it's very reductive work indeed um, and the idea is is that you can you, you know you can you can measure things these things very directly such as um, joint velocity and joint acceleration in different conditions um, that would be underpinned by a realist ontology that type of work um, a critical realist approach um, suggests that reality is out there but is still influenced by people in the research process so you can't um, um, you can't um, separate out the way we look at reality from reality itself although reality is out there somewhere this approach is often linked to um, approaches in social science and a key figure in the in the tradition of critical realism is sometimes seen as Karl Marx, um, who um, in the 19th century, I don't, he wouldn't have called himself a critical realist. That's a label which has been put on him by people in the 20th century. But Marx was somebody who studied the workings of the economy, studied the workings of capitalism, um, and he attempted to understand the underpinning laws and dynamics of the capitalist system and look at things like economic crises and so on, how they occurred, and look at the patterns which underpin different economic crises. So he looked at um, yeah, he looked at the, um, um, the reality of the capitalist economy and tried to understand the underpinning laws of it. And this is another key thing in critical realism that you can you don't just simply measure um, as you would as a, as a realist, just measure what you can see um, in front of you. Um, but you do try to understand underlying laws and dynamics of the reality which is out there as well. That's another key feature of critical realism um, and relativism. The idea is that reality is socially constructive and value laden and it's only apparent by interpretation in my own work um, the other side of my work at the moment is that I'm working on um, research with occupational therapists in Colombia in Latin America and looking at their um, the way in which um, um, stroke rehabilitation is carried out there and the barriers to developing stroke rehabilitation and the history of stroke rehabilitation in Colombia and I'm interviewing um, Colombian OTs and academics um, and about their experiences and views and the key thing I do here is it's a relativist um, approach because I'm looking at their their viewpoints their experiences their feelings and say, taking that as the key data that I'm working with. so that would be underpinned by a relativist ontology let's just move on quickly now because we're running out of time to talk about epistemology 
two key approaches to epistemology are um, positivism, um, which is marked by um, objectivity, um, determinism, um, which is the idea that um, um, everything has a specific cause which can be identified, reductionism, which is reduced, which means that you try to reduce things to the smallest possible unit of analysis. In my case, I'm interested in looking at upper limb movements of the stroke, but I reduce that down to looking at the for example, velocity of joint, joint movement in a particular activity. So reducing it down all the time to the smallest possible unit for the, for the purpose of analysis. Standardization and control, which is about controlling the variables, trying to remove bias for, for the results and making them as objective as possible. A constructivist um, and interpretivist, interpretivist epistemology, however, um, stresses the role of subjectivity. Um, induction, in other words, generating theory and hypotheses from the data, and holism, looking at things as, a, as an interconnected whole. And um, these things mark constructivism and interpretism. And I would say that generally speaking in occupational therapy um, research, the trend is generally towards constructivist and interpretivist epistemologies uh, underpinned, which underpin, sorry, flowing from a, a relativist ontologies. Um, methodologically, um, this, this brings us to finally to quantitative research approaches, such as the experimental approach, um, um, at, its, at its highest level, the, the randomized control trial. Um, and qualitative um, um, methodologies, which could include, for example, things like phenomenology, um, participatory reaction research, um, grounded theory, um, all different approaches, and, and eth ethnography, all different approaches to um, looking at, um, at, at data in order to understand the viewpoints, the feelings, and the experiences of the participants and seeing that as the key um, thing to look at. But as I said, I should say that, as I've shown in my own career, it depends what question you're asking at any one time. If you're asking a question about the range of um, motion in, um, in, the, in the upper limb following stroke, well, of course, you want to use a realist ontology, positivist epistemology and quantitative methods. If you're interested in understanding um, the um, occupational therapist's views on the, the history of stroke development of stroke rehabilitation in Colombia, will then use a relativist ontology, constructivist epistemology, and a qualitative research methodology. So it depends very much on the question that you're asking. Um, and there are different approaches which are valid for different questions. There isn't one way, I, I would say, there isn't one um, correct or incorrect way of, of looking at the world. It's basically about the question you're asking at any one time. So I think I've finished there. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid I don't think we have got any time for questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that overview on research methodology. Any questions, if you just want to submit them into the chat box, what we'll do at the end is we'll collate them all and then we can send out the answers to your questions when we send out the support and documentation at the end of the day. So thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. That was really, really helpful and it was really interesting to hear your own perspectives from your um, research projects. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tori. I've got to go now, but do, do you want the slides, by the way, or anything like that? Or do you want to? Yeah, that'd be really helpful. Thank you so much. Shall I email them to you? Yeah? Yes, please. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks right. a lot. Lovely. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So we're now going to take a 